I was like, I was approached by Jabeen, and she said, hey, Azmina, are you going to help me moderate a panel? I'm like, yes, I'm game to it. And then I said, who's on the panel, right? And she said, we have Ruchi, we have Susan, and we have Tina. I'm like, oh, wow. All four ladies? That's wonderful. <laughs> and a big hand, I would say all of us are design leaders, and I really want to celebrate that Jabeen has taken a wonderful initiative to get all four ladies on the panel. Yeah, and moving forward, you know, I wanted to say that we've been discussing a lot of AI and we've been discussing a lot of future of design, right? And I wanted to probably first start with design leadership, right? We all are design leaders. And I wanted to ask a question to Tina first, you know. And a lot of young designers sitting in the audience, what happens is we talk about a lot of good things, you know, when we come to a conferences. We talk about great ideas. But when we go back on our desks, you know, we have limited budgets, we have limited timelines, and we have the same old mundane work, right? I wanted to understand from you, Tina, that, you know, how do you push the envelope, especially with your designers? And with the tiny little budgets, you know, like limited scopes, how do we do that? I, I would say, especially when we are in a moment when we have new technology to use, I mean, this is really exciting, but the hard thing is um, kind of getting out of that mundane, you know, out of the processes and the tools that we're so used to using, those become very comfortable. Um, so when we do have new technology, we really need to, you know, climb that hill. Our CEO, um, Sasan Kadarzi, has said he's compared um, AI to electricity. So it's as transformative as electricity. And electricity actually took decades to become widely adopted. Um, and so we know that we need, we need to make that kind of a transformation too. Um, so a couple of things that we have done to kind of take our blinders off and um, increase our imagination around what we can do with uh, generative AI especially. Um, we've had demos. Um, so those are just very creative. We had something that we called a craft fair um, in the spring and it, it was our AI craft fair. And we had people demoing AI generated music, AI generated art, content, um, presentations, code. I actually, I'm an English major, but I actually was able to use natural language to code something to just, you know, rotate. It was pretty simple, but it was really fun. Um, so demos is one, workshops is another. We've held um, at least three prompt design workshops to kind of build skills. Um, and then a third thing that we've done is little competitions, little friendly competitions. I've got one running right now um, where at the end of every week where I'm asking all of the designers on my team to share some experiment that you completed that week with generative AI and give us your tips, what was, uh, whether it was fantastic or if it was a failure, um, did you learn anything, you know, think critically about it, what are your takeaways, and then I give a $100 spotlight to that person. So, and then that will become our, um, our best practice at the end of the That's week. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. But I would say that doesn't stop uh, Ruchi, you and Suzanne to add in. No, I think I echo what Tina said, right? So you start having an active conversation around these new technologies. You create spaces for people to experiment, to fail, okay, to learn new things. Um, and also there is a little bit of uh, hunch of not starting to use it. Oh my God, will it take away what I'm doing? So break away from that hunch, be open and embrace in new different ways. And let's experiment and see what comes out of it. Like there is no defined rule book yet. There is no playbook yet. We're all forming the playbook as we go along. But yeah, pretty much exactly just expanding on that, Tina. Yeah, I, I think I will just echo the themes that I heard both of you say. I, I love, Tina, your emphasis on imagination and yours, Ruchi, on, on experimentation. I think that's our role as UXers, is to, listen, the technologists develop the technologies. I work for a technology company, right? That's what CORE does. But it's our role on the UX side to say, what are the kinds of experiences we can create? And if you don't jump into that realm of imagining 
and experimenting and trying things out and not being afraid to fail, it, that's our role. That is what we do. That's the, one of the big values, I think, that UX brings to these periods of brand new bleeding edge technologies. Uh, as Rohan was talking about business, right? So, you know, we are often talking about experimentation and then being true to the business, right? And I wanted to understand, you know, uh, how do you draw that fine line? Because you also want to take care of the ROI, right? You cannot be experimenting forever. And uh, you do not have the liberties at times. So how do you manage that? I, you know, it's, it's, it's a very small needle you're trying to thread on this. Um, we're lucky at core that, that we, our customers are very interested in the partnership. They understand that this is the bleeding edge of technology. And not every customer, but many of them are willing to go on that journey with us. You're right, there are limits. Of course there are. There's never unlimited budget or unlimited time. But I think it's about the relationship between your organization and, and the customer. And more and more clients are also, we are, con we are a consulting team, right? So more and more clients are coming to us with very complex questions. They're saying, hey, whatever you do every day, that's fine. But these complex questions uh, and also kind of new ideas, how they're new perspectives. So there is that space which we create. And you're right, we have to balance with the usual BAU work and the ROI. But at the same time, the clients want to stay ahead of the curve. And they look at us as a consulting team to help them, nudge them, and show them new possibilities. And of course, some of them fly, some of them don't fly. That's the nature of design, right? That's how we work. Yeah, yeah I, I had a very interesting question. And this question is for you, sure. Ruchi. Yeah. Uh, I know IBM, I've worked there before, yeah. and we do a lot of enterprise, large enterprise transformations, mm -hmm. right? And we work with a lot of young designers. And sometimes enterprise transformations are not that exciting because these are not B2Cs, and these are B2Bs, right? Wow. Yeah. And they're often stuck, I would say, like, you know, okay, the client is not allowing us to exercise our creativity. So how do you probably want to go forward in that area? Yeah, so it's a... It's a culture, right, for us to develop a culture and a space for designers to experiment. You're right, they are projects which are exciting <laughs> and they're not so exciting, right? So we create those ex these kind of spaces where they can experiment with something new. So recently, we ran a hackathon for a usual design challenge, but we say, hey, can you bring in lenses of, say, AI, how can you use that? Extra scoring for that or maybe lenses of sustainability or different lenses which people can start thinking about. So we start keep creating those pockets of excitement and pockets of exploration because at times projects become a little mundane and people don't get the time to explore there. There are other spaces of exploring and that kind of strikes a new idea. So that's usually how we, while the work goes on, designers need something to always kind of chew on and experiment with and play around with. So we create those spaces for them to explore and uh, without any judgment, uh, just go and explore, play with it, and kind of do something. And of course, projects go on as usual. Um, on projects, also, we try to push the boundaries. So we also say, hey, go tell your clients, what if we could do this? Again, don't stop doing that. Often what happens is we start doing a certain kind of work, and we start getting boxed in that kind of work. So our gentle nudge is to, hey, that's fine what you're doing every day, but keep on asking little bit one step more, ask your clients to experiment more and so that you can do more eventually with the clients too. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a mixed bag, right? It depends where you can, but then create these spaces. And we have a large studio, it's 180 designers, it's a huge team. And uh, there is this culture of constant learning and uh, you know, smaller classes we keep on hosting in within, the, within the studio to keep that creative fire on for the younger designers. They have so much to contribute to. Yeah, that's a few things we would explore. Yeah. Uh, Suzanne, I, I was just going to add one quick thing that we um, say often uh, at Intuit, which is fall in love with the problem, not the solution. And that is always a good reminder. Yeah. Suzanne, I would just want to have a dilemma, especially you specialize with conversational UX, right? I bought a new car, and in that, I have a little 
AI enabled chat, or I would say, assistant. And the day I bought that car, uh, the car, the assistant could not recognize my voice. Yeah? And I was like, okay, now I've shut it down completely because whatever command I say, or whatever I'm trying to talk, not able to understand that. And I've also, like, you know, especially I'm talking about India as a geography, right? I have worked with cognitive toys, right? Where we had to shut down a project because the cognitive toy could not understand Indian dialects. So I would want to understand more about that. Sure. So this is a problem today. This, is, this was a problem 35 years ago when some of the very first commercially available automatic speech recognition was coming into existence, right? The technology has advanced hugely, but it's all an issue of how you train the algorithms. It's, it's not anything more exciting or more complex than that. I had this conversation over breakfast this morning about how years ago, um, the only voices that were reliably recognized at very high rates were white male North American voices. Okay? And why was that? It's because the engineering teams who were writing the algorithms were a bunch of white male North American guys. That's how it happened. When I started working with speech recognition technology, my voice was not reliably recognized. And I'm not talking about like long, long ago in the past. I'm talking 15 to 20 years ago. Um, one of the, the major speech recognition providers, it could not reliably collect yes or no responses from me. And so listen, it's, it's, there's an easy technological explanation for this, but I think what technologists sometimes don't realize is that that feels, from an experience point of view, like bias. You can understand his voice, but you can't understand mine. Um, and so it's, this is a real way in which we should be leaning into the new AI capabilities, the ability to ingest huge amounts of data, because there's no reason this should still be a problem. Localization should no longer be a problem. This is actually something that, that's kind of exciting. It's new-ish. I've just really learned about it in detail in the past month or so. Um, there are companies out there who will now sell you a custom ASR model. So if you can provide them with real audio samples from your user base in the environment in which they're going to be interacting, so for your example, I'd want audio from inside a car, right? Um, and from my intended localized population, build a custom ASR model that's going to fit your users. Um, it, so it's, it's, we're, we're moving in the right direction, I think. But there's, there's a lot of opportunity for us to do better. Who wants to add to this? Oh, I think you're right. I think, yeah, the more you train the AI to accommodate different cultures, different contexts, different languages, how you, how you speak certain things. And I interestingly just, rec I just remember that um, I think last month's Time magazine had an interesting cover. It said AI by the people for the people. And there was a startup. And uh, they usually, so we have all these multiple languages in India, and there were people who were recording that language. And the startup used to give the profit, a percentage of profit back to those people in the villages, etc., to kind of incentivize them for contributing and training these models and reinforcing this learning with new models. So this work is happening as we speak now. I'm hoping that technology matures as you know, we are doing this effort in the right direction. I'm seeing a lot of examples around where this work is happening. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, we have a lot of young crowd and, you know, they all start young and they experiment and they dabble a lot in different, different areas and they end up becoming generalists, you know, and now when they come out and they say, hey, now where should I be going? Because there's so much happening around me. There's service happening, there's like future AI happening. So Tina, this question is for you. I, you know, what do you want to say? Uh, what are the new avenues? these young designers can look forward to 
and also like you know how can i be away from becoming a generalist i'm always so impressed with the new talent that we have coming in i i can't believe the things that they're able to do you know like i said I, i'm an english major and so i came at design um in, into content so content design is is my specialty um i do hear a lot about generalists and general uh, generalization um, right now but um, I just encourage those new designers to get to know as many designers and different time types and kinds of designers as you can we have a, a new designer um, at Intuit who started about a year ago and she challenged herself this is a goal she set for herself to have 100 coffee chats in a year and I think she's almost there. And she has learned so much. Um, we've also got another content designer who is a really great sketcher and illustrator. And she's decided to take a rotation as a visual designer. Um, so I encourage all of that. I mean, the more that we can learn about each other and what we do, the more empathetic designers we become anyway. But what else wants to add to that? So listen, I'm a subspecialty of a subspecialty. I'm all in favor of finding that one thing that just ignites you, that is your thing, that gets you up in the morning, that you can still talk about after doing this same job for way more years than, than you want to admit, that you're still excited about. But you have to have what, what Tina talked about as well there, right? It, too many of us in conversation design work in, in our own little bubble, right? Where we're apart from the rest of the community. And that's one of the reasons that I think it's so amazing that, that I'm able to be here with you all this week um, for, for this show. So I think it's important to stay connected and learn as much as you can. But I also think it's great to find your one thing and, and pursue that vigorously. as Veena because you've been in IBM. Um, we follow a T-shaped structure. So you have your wings and your depth. So we say, hey, establish your wings as much as you can because that'll help you collaborate better. That'll and those could be things like, you know, agile or road mapping or PMing, whatever intrigues you, right? So have a nice horizontal, nice rich horizontal wing. And then, yeah, then pick up one thing which you absolutely love to do you want to be specialized in it. People should know you and call you for it. That will give you a sense of accomplishment on a daily basis. So that T-shaped template is what usually our designers usually work on and keep on refining it. Some people have thicker T's. They pick up two verticals and they go specialize in deep. And some people have multi-layered um, wings because they keep on going through some other interesting skills and keep on kind of adding to their, their toolkit, right? So it depends. It's a very creative exercise you've gone through, I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, that's again just to kind of what you guys are saying, something we do follow here. Yeah. That's nice. And uh, this reminds me that uh, I was working with a university design school where I said, that let's have a hackathon where we have even the technical guys, like you know, the engineering team, come in and not just have the design team come together. Like, you know, let's have two from the engineering side, two from the design side. We also had a fashion school, so two from the fashion side. Let's all come together and just do that, right? So again, I would say like, you know, design studios are the most happening places in design teams, right? Let's are creative, you have illustrations on the walls and all of that. But I often see the designers are still working with designers. They're not working with the tech guys. What do you guys want to talk or say anything about that? Repeat the question once again, but I didn't catch it. I'm just saying that, you know, what happens is, like, you know, designers are always working with designers. Oh, my God. That's an amazing point, right? <laughs> so, and I've been chatting about my team with this, right? So, the studio is a place where designers work. And I my always not just to hate, just not, not make it a bubble. Because that way you're not kind of collaborating with your other functional uh, leaders and, you know, kind of your developers, your data scientists. So, welcome them in. And there are, there are things you can learn from them and there are things they can learn from you. So yeah, yeah, I know designers like their nice, cozy studio and each other because they echo. 
but the constant pushes because also on projects when they go they to go and kind of collaborate and learn from your other peers um you will be surprised to know that um a lot of the developers and architects have a lot of in-depth understanding of how they break problems and that's very really similar to what how we break problems there a lot of synergies there so yeah that's something which uh, is a is a, is an ongoing change you're driving but yeah we do get out often in a bubble at times but we have to just break that and start uh, kind of uh, connecting with these folks a little bit more i think that's important yeah uh I, I'll, I'll say briefly, this is one way in which I think conversation design is a bit different than the rest of the UX design community because the technology that we're working with, like the way we do design is very bound up in the technology. And in fact, part of our UX team are the folks who develop those natural language models, right? Okay. That's, it's, it's a, I would call it a technical UX role. Right? It's, it's UX because it's about how the bot understands what the user's saying, right? But so we're by definition in conversation design working a lot more closely with, with technologists. I'd say I'll not talk about the teams, but I'll talk about ourselves. Uh, you know, there was a time when design was most seeked after. Designers were rock stars. And I would say it was something niche, you know. People did not understand design. But with Gen AI, with a lot of different things happening, it's got democratized completely, right? And everybody has an opinion, right? How do you feel? You know, all your thunder's gone. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, what was the last part of it? How do I you think, feel? How do you feel in this entire bit, you know, because we've grown up as designers, right? And there was a time when we were seeked after. And, but now I see that everybody's got an opinion on design. Well, that's an interesting one, especially with, you know, what happened one year ago with ChatGPT, and I'm in content design, and so all of the, all of the talk was, ChatGPT is going to take the writer's jobs away. Um, and so, you know, we in my team issued a challenge again to the entire team to start using AI because we knew that we needed to check our assumptions because it's very, very easy to say. And I've seen it on slides. I've seen people in our company say, we are going to produce twice as much content with half the writers because we've got this new tool. Assumption. I haven't seen it done yet. I'm not saying it can't be done, but we don't know how. We don't know what it looks like. We don't know how we're training, you know, the models to do this in, the, in our voice and tone. We are still really just scratching the surface, so we really have to check our assumptions. I know that, you know, we can say that it's going to take the writer's jobs, and then the writers are saying it's going to take the illustrator's jobs. The illustrator's going to say it's taking the coder's jobs. So we just don't know yet. There's so much we still need to learn. I sometimes feel like the people who are making those predictions about how AI is going to eat all of UX have a really naive understanding of what we do as UX designers and researchers. You know, that they think it's about making the pictures that you put up on the website or, or for in my world, just writing the words that the bot's going to say. That is like the easy and fun part of design and it completely undercuts the rigorous, intensive, strategic work that we do to ensure that solutions are going to meet the needs of end users. Awesome. Very well said actually. And um, you know, design is equal to wireframing. Design is equal to creating a few things, but they don't understand the depth of the practice. And I, I think personally, designers have a lot of work to do with these tech, co tech coming in, because you know what, some of your repetitive work might be offloaded, right? Your design systems, you're maintaining some files, you know, yeah, of course, why not, right? But now you have time and capacity to build the muscle to actually solve harder business questions, harder societal questions, uh, harder user questions, right? So that's the time we are giving you now to do that because all this while you were really busy with all the other things and that might just get off road. And that's good, right? It's good for you that it happens. Why not? 
Right, if it can take the production work away, you know, what we want to do is, is contribute in a more strategic way. Ruchi, I just wanted to further ask you another question, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where, you know, where does the man stop and the machine starts? <laughs> And when does the machine stop and the man starts? Yeah, that's a very funny, interesting incident, right? So, and, and this is my, uh, so, like, kind of, um, I got familiarized with AI back in 2018, 19, when it was very early in North America. And I was in Canada for a project. I got introduced to that. And I was asked to design the future of talent, of acquisi talent acquisition. So how will we hire, right? Because recruiters do a lot of manual man job, can I take it away? And the first chart I remember I drew that hey, here is the end-to-end -end recruiting journey, right from you know the, your onboarding or initial discussions, etc. And here are things which people are absolutely brilliant at, like the superpower, like relationship forming, like understanding people. That absolutely stays with people because it's about people. But things like filling up forms filling up mundane work, of course, that could be given to AI. So in my mind, that's the relationship. And again, it doesn't have to be, it has to be in tandem. If you need something, AI comes in, but again, all the people-specific relationships stays with people because you're best at it. And anything which takes you too much of task, and that's why I think that's where uh, this partnership will work. And, and the more you do that, this partnership becomes richer and richer because you realize that AI is learning, right? Learning about you, what you need, and you are able to do more what you want to do and not with the mundane forms and the paperwork you have to do. In a, in just an example, that's where it did start off. And again, this is an evolving point of view, but that's, that's what I think, yeah. Yeah, it, it allows people to focus on the tasks that require human judgment, right? That's something that you're not gonna get from ChatGPT. It'll have an opinion. But how well informed that'll be, you know, is is another thing. It's it's just like you said. Let let us get rid of the tedious parts and and do the some of the really important parts of design that that underlie that presentation layer. Yeah, uh, probably I would say we've heard a lot of AI today, right? There's been an overdose of AI, and everybody's taught us how to probably use it, how to exploit it how to not use it, there are different, different topics today, right? Ruchi, I wanted to probably learn from you today, like, you know, we've been two days in this conference. What are the three things which you're taking back? I think, um, as a designer myself, I, I think one thing we absolutely is, and that was a hunch I had, but that got confirmed in this conference, <laughs> that we absolutely have to go deeper into understanding people more, right? People's motivations, what they value, what bothers them, what fears they carry, what beliefs they carry. I think, I thought we should be doing it, but I think my, my, that, that hunch got kind of confirmed, all these discussions I've heard. So designers understanding people deeply is something is absolutely non-compromisable and that has to has in fact if you're not doing already you know i would encourage you to maybe upskill yourself in that space but get a deeper understanding about people because that will help us shape more responsible ai and shape the tools which are meaningful for people so that's one thing i uh, a hunch which got confirmed and I'm, I'm i'm going to go and equip the teams with that yeah i said three yeah. Yeah. Okay. I said three things. Three things. Okay. Three things. Wow. That's a hard one. Um, okay. So this is like a personal thing, right? So um, I know there's a lot of discussion around uh, business value, business ROI. And again, I am a commercial designer. I do it for a living, right? But I think um, there are a lot more layers to these new technologies. And I think in my talk also, I covered those layers societal layers, cultural layers, behavioral layers. I think we have to think about those two. Again, I understand we all have to be accountable for ROI, but at the same time, we also have to shape purpose-led businesses, right? If it's too much of commercial, then the businesses, I think somebody used the word soul today. I don't know who used that word, that it has to be a soulful business. So again, I think that's another takeaway that we should as designers, keep our head a little bit like sane and also focus on how can we 
create purpose, embed purpose in these business uh, value we're adding. And it's just not about just blindly the metrics, but also about the value we bring in as designers. Yeah, that's two uh, top of my mind. But, I won't yeah, drop anybody can pitch in. Yeah. Think of third one. <laughs> Suzanne is the same one for you. Oh, so, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Checking your assumptions, I think, is, is one. I, again, I just think that the assumptions um, that we have about what it can do for our jobs or what it will do to our jobs, um, uh, we have to get over that because that's going to limit us and what we, what we can do. Um, use the tools. Become expert users of the tools. Um, and watch out for bias. Um, I was just using ChatGPT this morning to come up with a list of um, actors that, you know, had a certain criteria, right? And it gave me all men. And I didn't ask for men. I did say the word actor and not actress, but the word actor applies to men and women. It's a gender neutral term. It gave me all men. The same thing had happened a while back when I was... Um, I was trying to have AI create some um, personas, and I was looking for a financial expert. So I was saying, you know, give me a financial expert who does this and this and this and has these sort of characteristics. All men. Until I would say, okay, now give me a female one. That was the only time. So watch out for those biases. Okay, three things for me. Um, it's been really validating um, to me to learn that so many of us in the, in the wider UX community share the way that folks in my corner of the world are thinking about generative AI, that, that we need to check our assumptions, that we need to, to yes, capitalize on the amazing things we can do, but in, in a way that still centers the user. Okay. Um, Another thing, and this is a super personal one, so I've been coming to UX conferences, not just conversation ones, for, you know, 20 something years at this point. And so many times I would give my talk about conversation design to eight people in a lecture hall this size, at a conference this size. Thank you guys for discovering that conversation design is a thing. Um, and I'm also, I, uh, this is sort of an add-on, but I'll make it my number three, which is I've been really gratified to talk to many of you who have said, yeah, I've, I've had this little conversation design project and like I'm a good designer, but I don't know if I can do this. And so I'll, I'll say to all of you publicly what I've said to a few of you privately, which is I would far rather have a UXer doing the conversation design than anybody else, but there's extra stuff you need to learn. The baseline that you have as a UXer will absolutely serve you in conversation design, but inform yourself about some of the specifics. Thanks, that's wonderful. I uh, One last question, and then probably I'll open it up to the floor here. The last question is like, you know, there was a time when we were all talking about, I would say, uh, Bitcoins and NFTs. There were conferences, right, on that? And then you had conferences on Meta. Uh, I, I remember a consultant selling Meta just last year. And now everybody's selling Gen AI. You know? I want to understand, is this just a fad? Is it just a phase? It's just a new boom? Or I know AI has always been there, but suddenly it's become the new flavor, right? So this is a question to all of you. Do you think it's here to stay? Is it something which will be forgotten? Is it something which will be leveraged? What are your thoughts? Anyone? So I think right now generative AI and large language models are both overestimated and underestimated. It's underestimated when people are like, eh, it's just a dumb machine. It's not like a person. Well, no, it, it can do some truly marvelous things, right? It has the capability to, to, to ingest 
such an enormous amount of data and, and analyze it in ways that are kind of beyond what we can do as human beings. So that's really amazing. But we also overestimate it when we're like, it's going to become sentient and it's going to, to kill us all, right? Um, the, the, the last slide that I didn't talk about in my keynote is this big philosophical debate right now that is going on in the conversational AI world, which is, should we be building artificial humans? Is that our goal? To make your AI agent be as close as possible to a person as you can? Or should we be building good tools for people to make use of using conversation? Um, I, I will admit I'm very firmly in the latter camp there. Um, there's actually um, a, a book in, in, from an earlier phase of conversation design that, whose title is, it's better to be a good machine than a bad person. <laughs> That's a nice one. That's That was great. I don't know what I could add to that. Um, but you had said it in your talk that we have had many forms of AI for actually quite a long time. We've been using facial recognition on our phones, and we've had text completion for our text messages. And so we've been using a lot of these tools for a long time. And it's true that generative AI has kind of, you know, taken over the headlines over the last year. Um, but it is just a tool. It's a brand new tool for us, just like, you know, these photographers have got a tool and what makes them special at using that tool is they are very skilled practitioners of the tool that they have. And we just need to become skilled pra practitioners of this new tool also. a question I was, I was just thinking about because still about six, seven weeks back, I had this hunch of, my God, this might be another fad. I could let it pass, but when I was preparing for the talk here, I did a lot of research, a lot of reading up on papers and what's the potential or what we could do with it. And I have, I think it's, my personal thing, it's not a fad. That's one. I think AI, if used correctly, if used responsibly, if used in the right way, which is adds value, I think it has lots to contribute to our lives in different meaningful ways. Um, I'm not a very tool-obsessed person, honestly. So I think the tools are a means to an end, right? You learn them. It is like we have learned. I'm from the era of Adobe Photoshop 5.5, and I have uh, learned numerous amount of tools. So I think it's yet another thing, right? So that doesn't matter. As far as we are leveraging it for the right things we are building, so uh, in my mind, AI is here to stay. And that's how I, that because of all the rigor I'm seeing. And so much of depth of thinking, is, your talk was really enlightening. I never knew about all those concepts. So again, a lot of depth it goes to, and I think it's here to stay. But it's all about designers to start learning about that depth, appreciate that, and work along with it. I think that's where I think uh, the focus would be. Um, yeah, that's my yeah, so I think that's wonderful, and I'm sure like a lot of people in the audience would have questions. Uh, are you guys ready with your questions? Yeah. We have a hand there. Can we pass a mic? Or do you, like, are you running out of mics? Then I can probably share this. Hello, I'm Anisha, and my question is, how do you navigate through using AI tools when you're aware of all the moral and ethical, ethical dilemmas around it that are yet to be resolved? And as leaders of such big organizations, is your team taking any steps on working around these dilemmas, and are you solving some of these things within your team? So that was a little bit echoey, but... Um was the question about ethics and how we ensure that we are, okay. Ethical dilemmas, I think that's what I heard, right? Yeah. Ethical dilemmas, right? So I think um, it's like anything you do, like ethical rights. So there's a value system we all stand by, right? Uh, if you're using an AI tool for anything you're doing, it's important to 
source it and say, hey, this is what AI did, this is what I did. It's very important to build that clarity. Um, and uh, yeah, like it's, a, it's a, it don't take the full credit, right? To just, uh, just say, hey, this is where AI comes in, this is where I come in. I know the questions will raise, and there was a question today somewhere in the talk that, you know, teams, uh, they undermine you if you're using AI tools, but if they are, then they are you know, not ahead of time. So you have to be using it for the right things. And then, of course, give credit to whatever you've used. So you're fair. Uh, I think that's what my stance be. The, the, the values doesn't change. Like anything else, you kind of you use your your royalties, your for your royalty-free photos, etc. The values don't change. I don't think that values change with AI as well. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. All all of the same things that we've been um, that we've been teaching our designers to emphasize about inclusivity and ethics and um, being aware of bias. Um, we just have to keep talking about them so that we do recognize it when we see it. In something about the way you, you described that, Ruchi, reminded me, uh, do you guys remember this um, Edward Tufte paper about how PowerPoint corrupts thinking? We have to be careful that we don't let this new tool corrupt our thinking, right? We as UXers have to maintain our same value structure in spite of having this new shiny tool that we get to play with, right? We, we still need to do responsible design. Hey. Okay. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Manas. Uh, I'm a product designer at Cash Free Payments. Uh, there was just one thought going in my head, uh, something very interesting uh, regarding the panel the discussion that we were having. So largely, if we see most of the AI bots right now are more of responders, like we have, we inspire some sort of a uh, thought in my, uh, in our head, like let's say, uh, create a, a pink elephant artwork and it will generate it for you. Will AI in the future uh, inspire us to take an action? So for instance, one fine day out of the blue, AI says, hey Manas, uh, how about we create a pink elephant artwork today? Uh, I've already ordered acrylic paints for you coming in seven minutes. Uh, just a thought, I'm really curious to know, where is that boundary that we can draw? Uh, just, just want to leave you with that. I, well, okay, so, so as I break down that, the question that you have, I'm hearing it as right now, we as the human beings are taking the initiative in these conversations with AI and we're saying, do this thing for me, right? Yes. Will there come a day where the AI comes to us and suggests, hey, maybe you should try this? Exactly. Um, I mean, I think we, some guardrails that are kind of there right now would have to be removed I'm not sure we want to remove those guardrails. I mean, you might want to in very specific cases, right? If you were, if you were building an AI tool to inspire creativity, right? Or to help in brainstorming or, or some, you know, limited use case like that, perhaps you'd want to remove the guardrails there. But I don't know whether I would want um, my AI assistant tapping me on the shoulder, telling me what to do on its own initiative, you know, I'm not talking about like a notification, right? I'm talking about it just decides, hey, today we're gonna talk about pink elephants. Mm. I don't know. I would say that I think that um, these assistants could get better at teaching the users how to use them because it, right now, a lot of times you're sort, it's sort of like you're faced with that blank, you know, <laughs> that blank chat box um, and it seems like a lot of users don't really know the right questions to ask or how to phrase them or what can you really do so I think the the bots themselves need to do more training of the, for the users. Yeah, just, um, I think what you said right Manas for me it'll be creepy if AI does that and I'm hoping we're not building it <laughs> somewhere I'm hoping we're not doing that I'm hoping I will always have agency and control on how much I want AI in my life. If I'm okay with AI tapping my shoulder and saying, hey, why don't you do this? Yeah, yeah, it's a personal choice, right? But if I'm not okay with it, 
and I'm saying, hey, I will activate this AI when I need to activate it. That's my choice. So I hope these systems don't take away my choice of deciding my own boundaries. And it can vary person from person. I'm, I'm able to be able to take a switch on off in some way and that way. I hope that's the case, but I don't know. I'm, the work is happening, so it's, it's progressing as we speak, but yeah. yeah. Uh, just to your question, you know, a thought came in my mind was like, how much time are you ready to spend with AI? Right? The more time you'll spend, probably it'll get friendly with you and then start tapping on your shoulder. <laughs> right? So it's completely up to you, like how much are you going to be training it yeah. and how much are you allowing it to come into your sphere. Uh, there was one more question. Yeah. So, hello. So, yeah, um, so we learned a lot of information today about AI and a lot of things, a lot of methods, a lot of jargons as well. So, uh, I mean, most of the people on the panel, I feel like, are from companies where there are large scale teams, right? So, what about small scale teams where, you know, uh, something like stakeholder collaboration is easy, where there's a lot of network for communication, but uh, there's also a lot of methodologies, and most of it fall, uh, falls on the senior designers, and they're always lost in this process, thought of process and what to do, and it often takes up the time, right? So how can AI help those small scale teams in particular is what my question is. Yeah. I can start, right? So I think um, some of the use cases which my team is experimenting on, and that's a very consulting point of view, right? So, you know, we, uh, we go and meet clients, and there's a lot of annual reports we read through, a lot of data we read through to understand how their business is doing, right? And AI has pretty decent, today, a decent capability of summarizing and ask a PDF or question a PDF. I, I can do that, right? I can share a public document with you and you say, hey, I am trying to look for these things. Can you quickly summarize? I'm heading for a meeting. Or you have a small team. You don't have capacity to do extensive secondary research or five people just sit reading papers. You don't have that capacity. I think that's one use case we've been experimenting with. Um, because we, things have to move faster, you need quickly want to ask very specific questions and then you get going with that. That's one use case. Um, secondly, I think also um, in the research process, very early when you have a lot of data transcribing, kind of just quickly get them in neat format so I can start my synthesis, that's another use case. Uh, we've been looking at tools like Dovetail, etc., which has these use cases. Again, not yet formalized, but some of those use cases where I can make a little bit things faster without losing the depth and the rigor of the process. I think that's a starting point for us. Uh, I'm sure you'd like to add more, but... Okay. I'm good. Okay. Yeah, so there is... Do we have time for one more? Yeah, please go ahead. So uh, traditionally, uh, users follow a call to action model, right? The user's mental model is seeing number of clicks, number of actions. But for AI, somehow we have moved to conversations. Now, why the mental model has changed and how we can adapt with it? Thank you. Reframe the question. So you are saying that uh, so now all before AI came, Right? We were like lesser number of clicks, etc. Now we're okay to have long conversations. That interaction models have changing a little bit. Is that what the question is? Yeah. Anybody wants to attempt it? It's about Web 2.0 and Web 3.0 now, right? So where what you're talking about was Web 2.0, right? Where the users were taking action, right? And now Web 3.0 is where you know you're getting an action and you're getting an interaction, right? So that's the shift that's happening in technology. I mean, even the, the graphical user interface was not really a mental model. That was something that we had to learn. We had to learn that moving my mouse is going to move the cursor on the screen and clicking buttons. I mean, that is all learned. Um, and so I remember thinking that you know, when we were first experimenting with chatbots and conversational interfaces, I thought, oh, this is incredible. This is going to blow the UI away because what could be more natural than conversation? This is something that we all know how to do. But talking to our software, as it turns out, is not that easy. So we still have to learn how to do that. 
Yeah, that's a wrap, I would say. But before we leave, I wanted this question for Tina and Susan both. Uh, how do you feel spending time with UX India? And what are your take backs from India? I'll just say um, the last time that I was here was three years ago in Bangalore, um, right before the COVID shutdown. And we've been building our design team uh, in the Bangalore office, you know, over the past few years. And I'm just blown away at the design talent out here. It's really impressive. Thank you. And, and, Similarly, I, I, will, I will say that I've been amazed at the really hard questions <laughs> you guys have been asking me. Um, I think that's one of the big benefits of getting outside of my little bubble. I've been so impressed with, with the depth of your thoughts around how conversation changes things. Um, and, and, and I've also felt extremely welcome. So I'll thank you all for that. <laughs>